Okay, excellent. Well, um, thank you so much, Bob, for inviting us to present today. And thanks to all of you for joining. Um, so Ben, if you could pull up the slides, that would be great. I'm going to do a quick little introduction for context, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ben, who's going to do um, the majority of the presentation. So just really quick a little bit about Agree or Alliance for a Green Economy. Um, we are a statewide organization working for 100% renewable energy in all sectors of the economy. Um, so that's the electric sector, the building sector, and transportation. Um, and we have a lot of our staff in Syracuse, New York, where we're headquartered, but we also have staff in other parts of the state. And we work um, with many organizations, including the Sierra Club, um, on lots of different pieces of energy policy. We have a specialty in um, a focus on utility regulation, and we do a lot of work in front of the Public Service Commission of New York. Um, we also have a, um, for the last six years or more, we've had local clean energy projects where we help people in central New York switch to renewable energy and energy efficiency and heat pumps. And we learn a lot from that experience and help lift up the voices and the experiences of people going through those programs. And that really informs a lot of the policy work that we do. Um, so next slide. Um, so you all probably know this, but just to level set, um, in 2019, New York passed a nation leading climate law, um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or as a lot of people use the acronym CLCPA, or Climate Act, or Climate Law, or some people even call it CLICPA. Um, so you'll hear this referenced a few times in the presentation, um, and many of you were probably involved in. Looks like I got muted. Okay, um, in the multi-year fight to get this bill passed. Um, and this, what this bill requires is that economy-wide, we achieve 40% greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 from 1990 levels and 85% by 2050. And that's not just the, in the electricity sector, it's in all sectors of the economy, um, including in the building sector where we're burning so much fossil fuels for heating and cooking and um, water heating and clothes drying. So it, it touches the places where we live and work and also the transportation se sector. Um, the bill also requires a just transition um, and has a lot of equity components uh, I think the the biggest piece is ensuring that what the bill calls disadvantaged communities or environmental justice communities receive at least 35% of the overall benefits of clean energy and energy efficiency programs with the goal is 40%. And it also requires state agencies to um, look at their actions and ensure that their all of their actions, every action that they take is not overburdening a disadvantaged community. Um, and out of this law, we have a statewide now climate action plan created by um, the Climate Action Council, which was also built through a multi-year process with many, many stakeholders and a lot of deliberation. So just setting the context for the plan we're going to be talking about today. Okay, next slide, Ben. Um, so as part of all of this, the Public Service Commission, which is the state agency that regulates our energy utilities. So these are the utilities that deliver electricity and gas to your homes. Um, the Public Service Commission regulates them. And when the law, when the climate law passed, there was a lot of, you know, discussion, of, especially among environmentalists and climate activists. How are we going to ensure that our utilities, especially our gas utilities, are complying with this climate law. And in May 2022, the Public Service Commission issued an order setting up a long-term gas planning process um, that it says these new, through this process, utilities are going to be creating 20-year plans for their systems, and these plans must be compliant with the Climate Act. Um, National Fuel 
is the first utility to go through this planning process. It's on a staggered timeline. So every other utility will follow them. And in fact, two other utilities are now in the planning process, but National Fuel is the first one through. And um, Ben's gonna talk a little bit about why that creates a lot of risks for this gas planning process being successful and aligning with the climate law. Um, but their plan is a 20 year plan. They will be renewing it every three years going through this process again every three years and updating it every year. Um, but the current plan that they've put on the table ends in 2042. Um, during this planning process, each long-term plan is analyzed by a um, independent consultant who's hired by the staff of the Public Service Commission. The staff is called the Department of Public Service staff. Um, and they're part of the process of assessing the plans from the utilities and for national fuel or national fuel gas, you'll see in the presentation NFG, that stands for national fuel gas. Um, the consultant on this plan is called Charles River Associates or CRA. And so they are hired by the Department of Public Service and are working at the direction of the public service to help analyze the plan. Okay, next slide. So I am going to pass it over to Ben, um, I think. Ben, do you think this is a yeah. good place for you to take over yeah. um, to talk a little bit about kind of where national fuel gas is in the planning process and what's in their plan and what all the different advocates have been doing about it? OK, great. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, Sierra Club and everyone for joining the call. I'm going to first just put our letter campaign into the chat, um, a link to this. So we are running this letter campaign. This is where I'm gonna end up in the presentation as far as this is not the only thing to do, but this is something definitely to do. And so I just wanna put that out there to start. Um, so going to where things stand right now, uh, National Fuel submitted its final plan. It's a third revision after two rounds of stakeholder feedback and AGREE, Sierra Club, Earth Justice, NRDC, Environmental Defense Fund, NYSERDA, and NYGO, among others, submitted stakeholder feedback. And um, many of us by now have done three rounds of stakeholder feedback. Um, so after that third round of stakeholder feedback, um, and after a third round of analysis from the consultant, Charles River Associates, um, all of which were critical of National Fuels Plan. The company uh, asserted in response that the company's final long-term plan should be adopted without modification. And so they have resisted really throughout the entire process any significant modifications to their plan. And so now the plan will go to the Public Service Commission for approval for modification or for rejection, possibly October 12th or 13th. They're doing a two day, two days in a row of sessions for their, their monthly um, commission meetings coming up in October. And it's possible that this plan will be on it. Um, and so I wanna just like, before I go into the details and I plan to get into, you know, like, pretty detailed and a bit into the weeds about this, but I want to just talk broadly about why this is important um, and you know, pause to emphasize why this matters. So the reason why it matters and why it matters statewide um, is because National Fuels Plan is, they are the first gas utility through this process and they are brazenly non-compliant with the CLCPA. Um, they are not coming anywhere close on greenhouse gas emissions. They have basically no plans to meet the requirements on disadvantaged communities. And instead of a rational strategic downsizing of the gas system, they are milking every dollar they can out of that system that is fueling climate change. And so we have to stop them. 
and we have to stop them, you know, because the plan is bad for their service territory and their customers in Western New York. But we also have to stop them so that they don't set a precedent where other equally bad, equally non-compliant, equally catastrophic plans are allowed to pass through the state for every territory, um, for every gas utility. So that's why this matters. It matters to the whole state in particular because it's so bad and because they're first. Um, so some things with the national fuels history with the climate law and why I would say that they're really bad or they're the worst here, uh, one of the worst actors when it comes to the climate law. Um, so they, they had actually, a, their president was a representative on the Climate Action Council, uh, but they voted against the scoping plan in part because it recognizes electrification as the best path to achieving the climate law's targets. Um, they're on the steering committee of New Yorkers for affordable energy, uh, which I think everyone should boo after um, hearing their name. That's an industry front group that has been orchestrating a campaign to promote fossil gas service and to weaken New York's climate law. They conducted a robo campaign in mid-February. They're currently under investigation for it using their, their customers' personal information to call um, and call on their customers to lobby state lawmakers. And then in May, um, New York Focus did a really great expose on them that they were caught using a customer funded uh, energy efficiency website to lobby against electrification policies. So they were using their energy efficiency website uh, basically to lobby against energy efficiency. Um, and it was the customers that were paying for that. Um, and I think one thing that is important to understand of like why they're such a bad actor when it comes to the CLCPA is that unlike some utilities in New York State, for example, at Con Ed that has, you know, they have gas service and they have electrical service as a utility, National Fuel uh, Gas Distribution Corporation only provides gas. They don't do electric. And then um, and like another level of this too is that uh, National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation, which is the utility, they are a subsidiary of National Fuel Gas Company and National Fuel Gas Company does, they're both a fracked gas distributor and a supplier. They do exploration, production, storage in New York and in Pennsylvania. Um, some things here just about why the long-term gas plans are important. I think that you all are aware of all of this. Natural gas emits greenhouse gases, including CO2 when it's burned and methane when it leaks. Methane is 80 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, I think you're all aware of that. I think you're aware that burning natural gas is a leading cause of respiratory illness in children, particularly when used for cooking. And by fighting for a strong long-term plan, we can limit the costs, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and keep our communities healthy. Um, there's been a lot of studies lately about the health impacts of natural gas. Uh, one coming out recently that 12.7 percent of childhood of childhood asthma cases in the U.S. can be attributed to gas stove use. So we have an importance not just for greenhouse gases but also for health. Um, so a couple of things about their plan. These are some big picture starting points about their long-term plan and its deficiencies. Uh, it reduces greenhouse gas in emissions by only 53% by 2042, with no feasible, no conceivable path to getting to 85% reductions by 2050. Uh, it promotes a hybrid gas heating system for customers so that they're saying, you will keep we want to keep all of our gas infrastructure everyone stays hooked up to gas and has a fracked gas furnace um but then also you'll have a heat pump and so you'll use the heat pump until it gets to like 35 degrees or something i forget exactly when they say that it'll be switched and then they'll switch to the gas furnace 
Uh, and so their plan fails to fully electrify even one customer. They don't, they're not planning to have any, not a single customer um, who is on gas right now to fully electrify. And of course, that's a self-serving assumption. They want to keep their entire gas infrastructure. That's how a utility makes its money. Um, so as we discussed, the consultant in this, uh, which serves as sort of a source of in, independent analysis, is Charles River Associates. And usefully and thankfully, they've been pretty good at calling out and being explicit about how bad National Fuel's plan is. So in the conclusion of their report on National Fuel's final plan, they write, more analysis must be done and a broader lens must be applied to ensure that NFG complies with the gas planning order and the CLCPA, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, considers the distribution of benefits to disadvantaged communities and minimizes infrastructure investments. So they're really clear in the conclusion that this plan should not pass. And that's really helpful. And I think it's just important to keep emphasizing this. And then at, in the introduction of the same report, I think they're even clear. They say that NFG has applied its assumptions selectively and the company often serves to hinder the forecasted pace of decarbonization efforts in Western New York. Um, and I haven't been doing this work for that this long for very long, but um, as I've been reading things, this is about as clear as it gets from anyone like a independent consultant that this plan is bad and that NFG is not acting in good faith. Um, so I think it's like particularly noteworthy. Um, so they mentioned Charles River Associates, the consultant mentioned faulty assumptions. Um, by my count, as I go through their final report, they listed at least a dozen faulty or baseless assumptions. And here are four that I thought were worth highlighting. I sort of mentioned this one, the first one already. National Fuel assumes that 0% of their current customers will fully electrify their heating by 2042 which is outrageous. Um, and it stands in contrast to the Climate Action Council scoping plan, which estimated that 85% of homes and commercial spaces around the state would be fully electrified from a mix of heat pumps and thermal energy networks by 2050. Um, so a huge difference. And obviously for a, a gas utility, they wanna keep all of their infrastructure and they're planning to keep it all. Um, the second point here, um, I didn't go into details in this presentation about it because I thought it might be too in the weeds, but if in q and A, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, but they do a benefit cost analysis. They have to do a benefit cost analysis for these plans. And when they're doing their benefit cost analysis, they are considering federal incentives, for example, from the Inflation Reduction Act as costs, not as benefits, as costs. Um, so a resident in New York could receive up to $14,000 toward a heat pump through the Inflation Reduction Act's federal incentive program. But when NFG is doing their benefit cost analysis for their long-term plan, they count all incentives, including federal incentives towards weatherization or energy efficiency as costs, not as benefits. Um, Right. Hey, I, I was just pausing there if there's a question. I see Gene there. Hey. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, the third one here, NFG does not assume any improvements to heat pump cost or efficiency in the next 20 years. And then uh, fourth on this list of outrageous assumptions, NFG does not account for cap and invest in their long-term plan at all. So they made no adjustments for how gas would become more expensive or how electricity would become cheaper as a result of upcoming New York state policy. Um, and then I wanna go into like, just trying to emphasize here how much their thumb is on the scale when it comes to making assumptions in this plan. So about heat pumps, 
the National Fuel wrote, it would be speculative to assume specific cost and technology improvements over the course of the 20 year plan. All right, so when it comes to heat pumps, they're not going to speculate at all about any improvements in cost or technology uh, or for 20 years. Um, but contrast this to when National Fuel, how National Fuel treated labor and resource constraints with weatherization and with uh, installing heat pumps. Um, and so they, they were asked by the Sierra Club um, uh, how they came up with these assumptions that they were saying that there's gonna be labor and resource constraints. And this was National Fuel's response. Um, so in a scenario that they used assumptions from called the supply constrained economy scenario, they incorporated assumptions to reflect the potential for labor and or non-labor resource constraints to impact National Fuel's LTP decarbonization actions. They are not based on any particular study and we are not aware of any studies that could have informed these scenarios. So this is national fuel in response to a Sierra Club question. So they're using assumptions. They're assuming that there's going to be labor and resource constraints based on no particular information. No information at all was given to back that up, but they still use that in their plan. Um, so I'm just trying to emphasize how much um, they are uh, putting assumptions in their favor with no evidence to back it up, and then they're leaving out assumptions that would be very reasonable, like technology improvements over the next 20 years. Um, now, I have a couple of slides here on cost. Uh, one cost, and I think that for a lot of people that have been doing this work, you might be familiar with leak-prone pipe and how expensive it, it is to replace leak-prone pipe. And to clarify, leak-prone pipe does not mean it's actively leaking. It means that the material it's made out of has been shown that it's prone to leak. Um, there's a whole different um, there's a whole different group of funds that are go toward actively leaking pipe to repair it and and deal with that. Um, but National Fuel will replace 110 miles of leak prone pipe per year um, up to 2035 at a at 1.2 billion dollars, and it ends up being 1,600 dollars per customer. So what we're saying with leak prone pipe and with all of the gas infrastructure is that use that money to electrify customers, uh, to stabilize the electric grid, to make it more re resilient and not to uh, continue to replace a soon to be obsolete energy system. Um, this is a cost estimate that they had in their plan. And when we look at this, I think that we have to be very skeptical of anything that they say because their, their um, cost analysis comes with all of those faulty assumptions assumed. Um, so they said that non-participants of hybrid heating would pay $217 per month. And this is like weighted for inflation and everything. Um, it's about a 60% increase. Because their assumptions are so bad, I think it would likely be much, much more, but that's what they have in their plan. And even with the amount that they put in, which is too much for people to take, um, they admitted in reply comments that affordability, affordability concerns and or stranded assets in the gas system will necessarily need to be shared by some combination of taxpayers and electricity customers. So this again is a quote from National Fuel, which more or less reads to me that they are saying they will need a bailout. They will need taxpayers um, and they will need policymakers to say that the electricity customers have to pay for stranded assets and the lack of affordability in the gas system in the next 20 years. Um, so some things that they're not doing, which they could and should be doing, um, in 2022, unions and climate advocates applauded and they worked together to pass the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Job Act. Thermal energy networks provide reliable heat and they also maintain well-paid union jobs. 
Uh, National Fuels Plan only proposes one modest ther thermal energy network per year, and which is again neglecting the guidance of the Climate Action Council scoping plan. The scoping plan asks utilities to consider moving, quote, whole streets or neighborhoods at a time from gas infrastructure to a community-based thermal energy network that supports heat pumps. They're not doing that, and they should be. Um, and then one of National Fuel's points, like this is what their robocall campaign in February was all about, is that they're saying that the gas system is more reliable and it's safer, and they talk a lot about the winter storms in western New York um, last winter. Um, so they claim that electrification is more dangerous, um, but we think that they're wrong. The status quo is dangerous. A quarter of the 47 deaths in Erie County occurred in freezing homes with natural gas furnaces that were unable to function without electricity. Um, you still need electricity to run a gas furnace. Um, and it's also because of the, the gases, it's not safe to run natural gas like through a stove for heating. Um, and the long-term solution that, that we should be pushing for is to put money into reinforcing the electrical grid, electrifying heating systems, and providing incentives for things like electric cars. So for example, a typical electric car battery could heat an efficient home with electric heating for three to seven days. Um, and this plan, particularly looking at like what happened with the winter storms, um, is discussed in the wind climate report called how implementing the CLCPA will make Buffalo safer in future blizzards. And um, I really recommend looking at that work. Um, and then, so just I'm closing up now, you know, what they want and what we want. They want to burn fossil fuels with no end in sight, escalating the cri climate crisis. And what we want is a just and equitable, renewable climate future. What they want are high costs to keep gas infrastructure and we want affordability and sustainability. They want old fossil fuel technology that leaks and creates health hazards, and we want safe, state-of-the-art cold climate heat pumps and thermal energy networks for reliable cooling and heating. They want an uh, abrupt end to natural gas only when required by the state, which is will burden customers with skyrocketing costs and leave workers without jobs. And we want a smooth phase transition away from fossil fuels that leads workers to good employment. Um, and so we are making a push uh, right now at, to the Public Service Commission to say they have to reject this plan. Um, and we're doing that in part through Action Network. I sent the link and I'll send it again. Um, and then here's my contact, ben at agreeny.org, if you've got like future questions about this. And that concludes my presentation. So we have some time for questions. Um, and so we'd love to, we'd love to take some questions. And um, we'd love for you all to take action with us. And we'll be continuing in the in the lead up to the October session at the Public Service Commission and possibly beyond if they don't rule on the plan in October, continuing to build up a drumbeat of opposition for the plan. So I think if you, um, Jack, thank you so much for raising your hand. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand like Jack did. Um, and you can do that from the little reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I can call on people in the order that you raise your hands. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, thanks a lot for taking my question. My question regards, is in regards to heat benefits tied to gas. Why are we paying the gas company for people that are not uh, hard on their luck for heat benefits? They don't give heat benefits for renewables. And I'm wondering what we're doing around the country here, what we're doing in the state to address the issue. Um, ben, if you want me to, I can take this one. Um, so Jack, what you're, just to tell everybody what you're referring to, it's the Home Energy Assistance Program. Um, Correct. Federal, federal program um, that helps assist 
people that um, are qualified by their their income um, to help support their heating bills. And um, this program pays helps pay for heating bills to sometimes directly to a gas utility, but sometimes directly to, um, you know, gives it to for an oil supplier. So it doesn't always go to the gas utility, but if you're a gas customer and you receive a heat benefit, it gets paid directly to the gas utility. Um, so Jack, I think what you're referring to is um, why the heat benefits are higher for people who are on a on gas for heating than for if they switch to a heat pump and need assistance paying for their heating bill when they're on a heat pump. Is that what you're referring to? Well, I'm well, I'm referring to why should people uh why don't we pay people for their low income for renewables to heat their homes for renewables instead of natural gas or oil or frac gas? Why is the system kind of rigged toward paying these uh, corporations? So there is some work being done on this. There is a little bit of advocacy every year around how New York um, kind of structures the HEAP benefit. And I can try to connect you with people that work on that. Um, but I think to answer your question, our whole system is built around an outdated Thought, thoughts on where we're getting our energy and has not caught up to the new technologies and where we need to go. And of course, there's very powerful interests that would like to keep it that way and would like to keep the status quo. Um, the heat benefits are really important for people who cannot afford heating in the winter. Um, and they're also, because they go directly to utilities, they really subsidize the utilities for having unaffordable bills in the first place. And there is a lot of thinking about taking that money and trying to get to root causes of energy affordability through energy efficiency and heat pumps and paying for other heating sources. But um, I can try to connect you with people who advocate around those issues. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And Diane, you're next, at least on my screen to the left, so. Okay. And then Merle, well, Richard, and Carol. Okay, well, one of the questions I have is, um, well, first of all, if you could put these um, contacts that are in the in the chat into like an email, I'm not really sure how to save this chat so that I can get back to it when I'm going to do it. Um, but aside from that, so a lot of these egregious things that National Fuel is doing as far as misusing funds that they have that customer funds for um, that you described earlier on. Um, is anybody suing them over this? Is the attorney general looking into any of this? The use of customer lists to promote um, uh, lobbying and so forth. Do you know if anybody is? Yeah, so I know that the for the February robocalling campaign, they are being investigated. And I think that's the PSC the Public Service Commission is investigating them on that. But I do not know if they are being investigated for the use of their energy efficiency website to lobby. Um, and the art as the article, the New York Focus article describes, it's against the law to use customer funds to lobby. And uh, it seems very clear that that is what's happening. Um, so, it seems like an investigation is warranted there, but I don't know if they are actively investigating it or if they plan to. So it's true well, for one of those things and I'm not sure for the other. Mm -hmm. Because the second, I, I can't remember exactly how you described it, that they were there, the customers are paying for energy efficiency information and they're using it to, um, you know, tell them, you know, yep. that, that, <laughs> probably is a is really actionable um because it's almost like they have a fiduciary responsibility to use that money for the purpose that they have it yeah so yeah. they they really should if if you have any lawyers around who would like to do that <laughs> that would i would think would be a really um useful lawsuit yeah and i think it's a systemic thing too that comes up in other places is where like the 
the utility companies and some of them like national fuel have nothing to benefit from energy efficiency like they're the ones that are given the funds to direct programs for energy efficiency and it's really mm-hmm. a, a flawed way of doing that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Has the Sierra Club, the, the Sierra Club does have a foundation that considers lawsuits. Have you brought this issue to them at all as possible? We haven't talked with the Sierra Club about a lawsuit. Um, I don't know if um, what other groups are planning, but Diane, that's a really good flag. Um, I think it was coming so fast and furious with like the robocalls and then the energy efficiency website and then their egregious plan. We've been kind of drinking from a fire hose over here. Um, But I don't know if Bob, you want to kind of check um, with folks in the Sierra Club if they're interested in doing something about this. And um, we can try to follow up and see if we can figure out if the PSC is investigating them or not over this issue. I, I, I would just you like to you work with Earth Justice uh, and and you know partner with the Sierra Club, but I will mention it to some of our staff, okay, on the chapter level. Yeah, I'd be willing to volunteer for that, Bob, because I think I read I read um, somehow I found and I circulated this to some people an article in some trade magazine about this organization. Um, it's a fake not for profit to. Um, lobby against to stop the Climate Action Act, and um, and they outlined and this was started by the propane industry. They outlined exactly what they want we're going to do, and they got the uh, national fuel uh, the the other gas companies to join in with them. But they said they were going to do this, and they said, well, you know, our customers want. I like this, and but this, but the, their solution was this is our life. They're fighting for their lives and they don't care. And I think that basically they're stepping way out of bounds and they should be brought to heel. And I'd be willing to to help out if you've got somebody who'd be a lead attorney. I'd volunteer for that. So I'll keep that in mind and I'll pass that along. Okay. So be careful for emails coming in. (laughs) All right. I think Merle is next. My my question is, does the Public Service Commission have any authority to force National Fuel to come up with a better plan? Yes. Uh, ben, do you want me to take this one or do you? Yeah. So um, in the ga- the in the initial gas planning order that set this process um, kind of into effect, they basically they. They had some high hopes that through multiple rounds of plans and stakeholder feedback, that there would be some coming to consensus between utilities and the DPS and the various stakeholders on what the plan should be. But they said um, in the event that there's a final plan filed that has opposition and is not a consensus plan, um, the commission will be the body that decides what to do about the plan. And so um, yes, the commission does have the authority to make a ruling on this plan and to determine whether or not it's compliant with the climate law or compliant with the gas planning process. And um, because this is the first plan going through this process, we're not really sure what kind of order they will issue or how long it will take them. Um, but what we're hoping for is that they will reject National Fuel's final plan. Um and that they will either modify it so that it does comply with the Climate Act. There's you know, been a lot of work by advocates. There's so much information in this docket about what the plan should say to be compliant with the law. And the Climate Action Council scoping plan you know, basically provides the roadmap for what a utility's gas plan should look like. Um, so the commission has a lot to work with to modify the plan. They may also just send them back to redo the plan. We don't really know what will happen, but they definitely have the authority to reject it or modify it. Thank you. Um, I think, Richard, you said you were going to pass. So maybe we can take Carol's question. Um, Carol put the question in the chat. Which, oh, sorry, uh, what is DPS staff's re- reaction to this proposal? 
Ben, do you want to take that one? Yeah, well, yeah. you kind of answered it, um, but if it's going to the commission, does anything come to the commission without staff having weighed in? So just by very virtue of the fact that it's going to the commission, does that mean that staff is kind of on board with it? No, and so this one is, this is really different than the rate case process that we're familiar with. And so it's not like they've settled on this plan and instead of DPS, there uh, is that consultant, Charles River Associates. And so they're the ones that are analyzing the plan. And and the plan is definitely not any kind of consensus. Charles River Associates has been very clear that they don't support the plan as written. Um, and then the last, uh, the last word from National Fuel, which I had quoted in one of the first slides there, was that they want, they think it should be passed without modification. And so this stage is, I think, over. And now it's just going to be the Public Service Commission is going to get these two really different narratives, National Fuel and some industry groups saying this is great, and all of the environmental groups and NYSERDA and the consultant saying this plan can't pass. Hmm. This is, can I respond? This this is interesting because I attended, they, they, they held just the first introductory session for the NYSEG RG&E long-term plan. And it sounded like Charles River Associates was introducing themselves as just, just there to make sure the process went smoothly rather than that they were going to be you know commenting on the on the plan and maybe that's just at this point but it was it sounded like a different role than i'm hearing here so talk about that in the future but it's i don't know if they're because of the this process the na national fuel whether they're changing what they're doing or not i think as far as i know it's the same um and and i think they'll play hopefully the same sort of role so um, I think we'll go to Bob. Thanks. I I had two two questions. One was uh, I've heard that uh, even though National Fuel is basing an assumption on their their heat pumps that they only heat to thirty degrees, I think above Fahrenheit, which is the older models. There are cold weather air to air air to air heat pumps, not even geothermal. But, uh, that heat to uh, 13 below Fahrenheit and uh, Maine, the state of Maine, I, I understood there was an article in Washington Post they gave out 116,000 vouchers to uh, homes in in um, Maine to to have these installed and they seem to be working well. So, you know, why this, why this, do, do you have any idea how a uh, um, national fuel can even ignore their existence at this point? It's not like it's something that's going to be developed in the future. It sounds like it's already developed. Yeah, and that's a great point. And there was a lot of feedback. So their initial plan, and I think it might have also been their second round of uh, their second plan, had only standard air source heat pumps, not cold climate heat pumps. And they were using that in part to, you know, justify this hybrid heating system saying, you know, Western New York is a different climate than the rest of the state and it gets so cold here and it, they can't rely on heat pumps. They did in their final plan, it was one of the minor modifications that they made based on stakeholder feedback. They did then model for using cold climate heat pumps, but they didn't allow that to change any of their assumptions, like thinking that then at least some percentage of their customers would go fully to heat pumps. They didn't, you know, they didn't include that in any of their modeling. So they did change that sort of on the surface level, I guess I would say, um, but didn't let any of the implications of that really sink into their plan. I, I think this is, you know, Bob, what you're pointing out is one of the most egregious aspects of their plan and it's so self-serving, right? To to give people inferior technology um, in order to maintain the gas system and keep people hooked to the expensive gas system um, is, you know, 
really egregious and um, not at all what the Climate Action Council anticipated or put in their plans for New York. Um, I'm glad they changed it. I'm glad they changed their assumptions, but as Ben said, um, they're still planning for all of those customers to stay connected to their gas system. Thanks. Uh, uh, th that brings me a little to my second question where uh, maybe, you, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I, I always thought that that New York had set up a system back in the 90s that the suppliers are supposed to be separated from the utilities that deliver the services. But uh, even though it looks like you've got these separate corporations under the umbrella of national fuel gas, like the distribution is supposed to be distributing gas, they still own, the, the overall corporation owns 2,700 fracked gas wells in Pennsylvania which, as you said, I mean, they're, they're so vested in keeping this uh, this frack gas in, in, you know, in, in the mix and, and strictly in the mix. It, uh, I don't know if, if anybody's ever addressed that, that, that those two companies should probably be separate. <laughs> you know, then we wouldn't have to be worrying about the distribution company pushing so, so hard to keep, to maintain gas. This is all money in our pocket. You're absolutely right, Bob. And we did go through restructuring in New York and separate distribution from supply, um, at least on the electric side. And I don't know on the gas side um, whether the laws and the regulations are, you know, require that separation. So I'm not sure why they're able to get around that, um, you know, for that gas company, but maybe it's because I think this restructuring was mostly on the electric side. Yeah. But uh, somebody with more memory or um, understanding of the deregulation in the 90s would need to answer that question. Thank you. And I think it's Brian next. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, which actually answered a lot of questions that I had in mind going into it. Um, for, for those of you especially who uh, engaged more with the PSC and you know how they operate. Um, my question is around that, like when you get into this meeting that will be October 12th and 13th, and you said potentially that's when the decision could come, um, is it typical that they're having a two-day meeting? Is it is it something special just to make this decision possibly? Uh, how confident are we that we're going to have a decision in that meeting or that it may be pushed out? Is it, uh, is it kind of based on any kind of intel or knowledge about what their plans are? I guess anything that uh, you know about that, about the process that may be coming in, in that meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, and good to see you. Um, and I, I think I had trouble hearing a couple of those questions, but I think I got them all. And um, they're having that two-day meeting. I I think that the NYSEG rg &E rate case is likely to come up. They haven't set an agenda yet, so we don't know what's happening, but it, it, they are doing it back-to-back -back days. So they must be planning for a lot on that agenda. We don't know if the, the National Fuel Gas Plan will be on that yet, but that's when it could come up. It seems like everything is done in the case, right? In the in the proceeding, there's doesn't seem to be anything else happening there. So it's now at the PSC's doorstep, um, and we have no idea. I don't think of what will happen because it's the first one. So since this is the first long term plan to go through, I I don't know if we have any good guesses about what will happen. I think that. Uh, if we were being optimistic, we could say the plan is so bad and the consultant has been so clear on that in addition to NYSERDA, in addition to all of the environmental groups that, uh, you know, hopefully they don't dare to pass this. Um, but I think also as far as like why we're here and what we're doing is that we really need to make sure it doesn't pass. And we really need to make sure that there isn't precedent set that they will pass a plan that is so egregiously bad. 
And so I think we have to just continue uh, making noise about it and organizing and putting in comments to, to just make sure that it, it does not pass. Um, and then actions taken, I see Diana in the, the chat there, and that's a good, so there's, there is the letter, we have like the online letter campaign, so please do that, please um, adjust it, personalize it, especially if you're in the Buffalo area, you know, like Merle, the note that you put in, I think that's a great story to be told. Um, uh, so anyone in the call from the Buffalo area, I think like a customer of National Fuel, make sure to include that in the letter. And then I know that Push Buffalo, I won't say, I won't give too many details because is the call still being recorded here, but I know Push Buffalo is planning um, an action in October um, to, they they have been going, you know, on the street and door to door to sign cards against this plan. And uh, they've they've collected a lot of them and they're they're going to be doing an action with those cards in October. And so um, we're gonna, think, we're gonna meet tomorrow at which uh, yeah. So I think that you know, it's that's important. Um, and then I don't know what else, but I think that we we should all stay in conversation about what else. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just add here, Brian. You asked whether it was normal for the PSC to meet for two days instead of one, and it's. First, I've seen it, so it's it's not that normal. So they must have a lot on their agenda. And as Ben said, we don't know if this is on it. So we may have about a month to keep the drumbeat going and keep raising the resistance. Um, and just some things that we've done to raise the resistance so far. Um, in addition to us putting our comments in, we did sign. We had groups sign on to our comments. Um, so. Andra, who's on the line, did a lot of work reaching out to all of our allies across the state. And the last comment that went in, Andra, do you remember how many groups signed on? Um, yes. In addition to agree, there were 116 groups. Yeah. So we've, you know, been getting the word out across the state and and building resistance um, and demonstrating that resistance in our in our filings at the Public Service Commission from across the state. And then at the Public Service Commission meeting last week, we knew this was not on the agenda, but we wanted to get this in front of the commissioners. So a bunch of folks from Push Buffalo were went to, um, to Albany and held signs in the Public Service Commission's meeting. Um, and some of Agree staff joined them and some of our allies joined them and they were seen by the commissioners. So um, we're gonna keep trying to think of ways to get visibility to the issue and to demonstrate the resistance. Um, we never know what will go on public service commission meetings. It's one of those things that we really don't get intel on, but we do get the commission agendas on the Friday before the meeting. So we have about a week's notice. If it's not on the October agenda, we'll be con we'll be trying to figure out, you know, what we do from middle of October till middle of November to keep the, the drumbeat going. And what I've seen sometimes is that when something's controversial, the commission will delay an order. And we really want them to issue an order in this case and to reject this plan because we need to send a signal to the other gas utilities that are currently starting their gas planning processes that the national fuel plan got rejected and won't fly. Um, so, you know, I guess stay tuned to hear from us if we need to continue to kind of beat the drum and get an order out of the commission if they don't or if they don't issue one next next month. I, I just wanted to mention, I, I think Ben said he had to leave at 7.30 and at 7.29. So I don't know if you want me to stop recording now or, and then we can have a further conversation or. Yeah, why don't you stop recording, Bob? I'm I'm here um, for longer than Ben, so I can continue to answer questions and hold discussion. But I know, um, Diane, you've had your hand up for a while. And I just you want to thank Ben for, for coming. Thank you, Ben, so much. Thank you all. Thanks for the, the questions and good to see folks and meet folks on this call. And um, I hope we'll be in touch about later steps and actions. And Ben, do you want to drop your email in the chat one more time? Yeah, I will. Um, so feel free to get in touch with Ben. Um, ben is following 